Uh, first set of questions is environment, climate change and land reform. Question one, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent petition on the First Minister to declare an ecological emergency. Cabinet Secretary. Tackling the loss of biodiversity ranks alongside climate change and importance and our actions are designed to address these twin issues in tandem wherever possible. For example, through the £250 million investment in peatland restoration over the next 10 years. The programme for government further announced an extension to the Biodiversity Challenge Fund of £2 million, which increased to £3 million in the budget, totalling £5 million overall since 2018-19. However, this is only a small part of the estimated £98 million that we spend on biodiversity each year in Scotland. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. This is a petition by youth environment campaigner Holly Gillibrand. It's a pity that meeting our HE target seems highly unlikely this year, especially given the importance of the Convention on Biological Diversity um, in Scotland. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge a correlation between the missed targets and a five-fold drop in official SNH monitoring over the last decade and the significant reduction in SNH funding since 2007. Cabinet Secretary. I don't think that uh, it is possible to draw a line in the way that uh, the member is trying to do. Um, the HE uh, targets are indeed challenging, uh, but meeting seven out of 20 compares favorably with the global picture of progress on only four out of 20. Um, so um, yes, there's a very great deal more to do in Scotland, um, but we are already doing a very great deal more um, than most other countries in the world. Um, uh, SNH uh, um, makes its decisions about how it manages its budget on the basis um, of uh, their own professionalism. Um, and I believe that uh, um, from their perspective, they are not doing in any way anything that would damage our ability to try and meet those targets in the best possible way uh, uh, that we can. We're not complacent. We do know that a lot more needs to be done. And indeed, the conference in April, which we are currently attempting to turn into an online conference for reasons which I needn't go into, um, is part of that, but also part of our global commitment to this work. Brief supplementary, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Climate change is a key driver of biodiversity loss. What measures in the environment and strategy will go towards creating and restoring natural habitats? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the environment strategy sets out the links between the crises and climate and nature, which I've already mentioned. Climate change is a key driver of biodiversity loss, and healthy natural habitats do play a vital role uh, in removing carbon from the atmosphere. The resilience of the natural uh, environment in the face of a changing climate is a key element of our adaptations programme. Our focus is on the most effective and complementary policies to address both the climate and nature crises, which is why I will keep mentioning the amounts of money that we've put into peatland restoration because that does actually deliver these multiple benefits. And other nature-based solutions are also incredibly important. For example, tree planting, uh, protecting and enhancing our seabeds. Um, and these are both things that are also key parts of that dual plan to address both climate change and biodiversity loss. Question two, Liam MacArthur. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on preparations for a ministerial visit to Orkney to view the impact uh, of resident greyline geese on farmland and crops. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Liam MacArthur may recall that I wrote to him on 17th February to provide an update on my proposed visit to Orkney to see firsthand the impact of resident greylike geese on farmlands and crops and to discuss potential solutions. My office is currently looking at potential dates and will be in touch shortly with the Member's Office and the National Farmers Union Scotland branch on Orkney to agree a suitable date for the visit. I also understand that uh, my colleague uh, uh, Marie Goujon is finalising uh, dates to visit Orkney separately and she would be happy to meet Liam MacArthur if he would find that useful. Liam MacArthur. I would certainly find that useful. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, both for her answer but also uh, for taking up the invitation to come to uh, Orkney to see firsthand the damage caused by a large and growing resident grey line goose uh, population. As well as um, agreeing the details of the planning for the visit with Orkney NFU, given the progress that's been made in setting uh, up the various options to control resident grey lag uh, geese in Orkney, will the Cabinet Secretary confirm that there will be funding available to continue with these control measures should they prove successful in reducing overall numbers? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, 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 I 
just want to be clear with the member that I think the original agreement that I'd made with him was to try and have this uh, visit in early summer um, for uh, reasons uh, of my own diary, which is why I've um, offered that the minister perhaps might want to think about uh, separately meeting uh, with the member. In respect of um, money, we have committed to continue a level of funding uh, until spring 2021. Um, I, I can't really commit to further than that for very obvious reasons that have to do with budgets and budget timetables, um, but I'm sure that that will be an active part of the conversation that he will wish to have uh, going forward. Question three, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how measures in its budget for 2020-21 will help Scotland to meet its climate change ambitions. Cabinet Secretary. The budget directly responds to the global climate emergency by proposing an ambitious package of measures to help to deliver our transition to a greener and fairer nation. This was recognised by Chris Stark, Chief Executive of the UK Committee on Climate Change, who said climate change is taking centre stage in Scotland's budget. We're investing over £250 million of multi-annual funding in peatland restoration, uh, in introducing a new £120 million package to deliver a heat transition deal and begin decarbonising our heat usage, delivering an initial £40 million for the Agricultural Transformation Programme and making over £100 million investment in active travel. I could also mention a total low-carbon capital investment of around £1.8 billion in 2020 21 at £500 million more than 2019-20. By taking decisive action now in areas that are challenging to decarbonise, we have shown our commitment to tackling the global climate emergency. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. Clearly, uh, local authorities have a critical role to play in responding to the climate emergency. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what steps the Scottish Government is taking to incentivise local authorities to use the assets and levers at their disposal to reduce emissions and boost the economy, including the Green Growth Accelerator that was announced as part of the budget for this year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is true that local authorities, like uh, all of the public sector, have a vital, uh, vital role to play in tackling the global climate emergency, which is why we have made significant commitments to supporting their efforts in this budget. Um, measures include the new £50 million Heat Network's Early Adopter Challenge Fund, which will allow local authorities to either significantly expand or instigate the development of heat networks critical to decarbonising the heat in our homes. Um, as the member has noted, Green Growth Accelerator is another vital lever, and at budget uh, time this year, we made a £200 million multi-year commitment to deliver additional low-carbon investment through this mechanism. We are committed to working very closely with local government and the wider public sector to go further and faster towards net zero for the benefit of all. Supplementary, Finlay Carson, briefly. Uh, Dumfries and Galloway claims to be the birthplace of renewables because it was the first place to have onshore wind farms, the first off, uh, onshore uh, wind farm. Would the, the Cabinet Secretary accept my invitation to visit Dumfries and Galloway and explore how uh, the region could be an e exemplar for COP26 uh, for local action and partnership working together uh, to respond to the climate change challenge? I, I get a distinct sense of a pincer movement on uh, Dumfries and Galloway emerging over uh, this last 24 hours. Um, yes, of course, I'm always uh, happy to visit all parts of Scotland. Um, and if there are specific things that uh, the member would wish me to come and see or people that he would wish me to speak to, we will do our very best to make sure that we can fit that into my diary. Question four, Patrick Harvey. To ask the Scottish uh, Government what discussions it's had with small brewers and specialist retailers regarding its plans for a deposit return scheme. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has met with small brewer representatives to discuss deposit return on two occasions, and that engagement is ongoing with a further meeting scheduled to take place on Friday of this week. Uh, I also plan to meet with representatives of this sector in the near future. A number of retail and brewing trade bodies also participate in the various working groups formed to progress our plans for DRS, and I do look forward to laying the final regulations to establish the scheme shortly. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful for the answer. Scotland has a fantastic range of small independent brewers right across the country, as well as retailers that specialise in their products rather than in volume sales of mass manufactured products. These businesses want the DRS to work, 
uh, but does the, the Cabinet Secretary recognise that it needs to work in a way that reflects the specific circumstances of those small independent producers and retailers, and that big business has had a bit more of a voice so far through the advisory uh, board Thank than you. the small businesses have? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I, I would absolutely agree. Um, we are keen to ensure that the scheme works well for small and specialist producers as well as retailers. I think that's uh, very, very important. Um, there are some uh, proposals being brought forward by the uh, Eclair Committee, and we are very carefully considering them. Uh, and we are committed to working with industry, including small businesses, on the actual implementation of this scheme. So we are looking very closely at some of the things that may uh, uh, assist or uh, reassure um, the small businesses uh, that their, um, uh, their concerns are being taken care of. Um, and uh, I hope uh, very soon uh, that people will see that when the regulations are laid. Supplementaries Colin Smith and Annie Wells, you both have to be brief. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Deposit return scheme is going to have a unique impact on those businesses close to the English border, particularly a small business who may sell uh, in home deliveries to premises very close to each other, but either sides of the border. Can I ask what action is being taken to, to mitigate the challenges that those businesses will face? Um, that uh, is something that has been discussed. Um, I should make it very clear to members that it is a scheme administrator um, when that is up and running that will actually have to look and consider the potential for what I, I guess we might call some fraud uh, in, these, uh, in, these, uh, in these instances. That is something which is on the radar, however. We do understand that there are some areas and some difficulties, but um, across Europe there are a variety of different schemes in operation that work on different sides of the border. These issues are not insurmountable problems, uh, and I don't suppose for one single minute that we will not be able to find solutions for Scotland. And Annie Wills. Cabinet Secretary, I've only been in this role a few weeks and already businesses at almost every single stage of the supply chain are raising concerns about the DRS scheme. We're fully behind the principles of the scheme and most businesses are too. But, the, but businesses are worried no, that the government is rushing the scheme. So can the Cabinet Secretary, let's, so to the Cabinet Secretary, let's do this but let's get it right. Will you agree to delay the deposit return scheme right. until small businesses are, are on board and ready to make it a success. Yeah, I do mean brief. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I will be uh, laying the regulations very shortly. Uh, all will be answered at that point. Question five, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy. Cabinet Secretary. An independent review of the Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy has been completed and has identified priorities for additional action. A new strategy taking into account the review findings is now being produced and will be subject to consultation. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Friends of Air Scotland reported that there are still streets in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee and Inverness which are in breach of legal limits uh, that should have been met a decade ago. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain why we are still waiting for these targets to be met? Well, there are a very small number of uh, streets in Scotland where there continue to be issues. That, of course, is why we've introduced the uh, 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 low emission zones in Scotland. That is why the work is being done to ensure that those low emission zones work well and deliver on air quality uh, what I think everybody wants to see. Uh, and, of course, once the largest cities uh, um, have low emission zones in place, we will be then moving on to other local authority areas with uh, air quality management areas and considering whether or not low emission zones might be appropriate for them. That is all work that is ongoing and has been brought in precisely to do exactly what the member is suggesting. There are four members looking for supplementary on this. To be fair, I'm not taking any of you, so I can go on to question six. Ross Greer. Thank you. <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government, in light of its response to CIFA's consultation on the matter, for what reason it did not object to the application by the Ministry of Defence to discharge more radioactive waste into the Gearlock? Cabinet Secretary. The Member will be aware that matters of defence are reserved to the UK Government. The Scottish Government is fir firmly opposed to the possession, threat and use of nuclear weapons. They are morally, strategically and economically wrong, as well as being indiscriminate and devastating in their impacts. For as long as the UK government continue to base their weapons in Scotland, our primary concern is the safety of the people of Scotland. The responsibility for regulatory matters at specific sites lies with the independent regulator, SEPA, who are now publicly consulting on the MOD's application. Ross Greer. 
Thank you. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments about the moral outrage of the very existence of these weapons. Uh, but the reality is the Scottish Government are a statutory consultee in a process where the Minister of Defence are proposing discharging up to 52 times more radioactive cobalt-60 and up to 30 times more radioactive tri tritium directly into the gear law. The Scottish Government, as a statutory consultee, did not object. I'm simply asking why? Cabinet right Secretary. now, the consultation is open until 13th of March. I encourage everybody uh, who is interested in this uh, to make a submission to the consultation. Uh, following a vote for independence, obviously we would be making an early agreement to remove all of this from Scotland. Uh, and while I appreciate that Ross Greer himself would certainly agree with that, those others who are concerned about this issue might ponder the future uh, and why they will not follow our view that independence would be the best option in this one. Question 7, Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much coastal communities in the North East have received in Crown Estate revenues since the Scottish Crown Estate Act 2019 came into force. Minister Mary Goujon. In September 2019, Scottish Ministers announced new funding arrangements whereby coastal community benefit would be sourced from the net revenue of the Scottish Crown Estate. Now, this announcement included £7.2 million worth of funding to coastal local authorities in 2019-20 based on a distribution formula which had been agreed with COSLA. And of all that amount, over half a million pounds of the fund was provided to council areas in the North East for coastal community benefit. And a further announcement will be made in due course on the allocation of funding for year 2020-2021. Gillian Martin. I thank the Minister for that answer. As the revenues from the Crown Estate are allocated to local authorities, will there be an assessment on how this funding has been delivered to community projects by local authorities and an appraisal of the guidance available to those communities looking to make applications? Minister. Uh, in response to that, the Scottish Government's monitoring arrangements will be used to develop a, a report on how the funding has been used by local authorities and that will include the information on funding to individual community projects and we've requested information from councils on how they plan to use that funding and as you can imagine we'll be looking at that information with some interest and we're also in discussion with COSLA and with the stakeholder advisory group on the Crown Estate on the potential need for guidance to local authorities but I would also highlight that there's nothing preventing communities making a request for a share of that net revenue to their local authority for the benefit of their own coastal communities. Question 8, Daniel Johns. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that there are adequate climate change risk assessments in place in all policy areas. Cabinet Secretary. Climate change risks, including severe weather, flooding and wildfire, are included in the Scottish risk assessment process, which informs communities and responders on preparing for and mitigating such events. The Scottish Government's climate change adaptation programme follows an outcomes-based approach aligned to the national performance framework. This ensures that adaptation to climate change risks is integrated into wider Scottish Government policy development and service delivery. As set out in the programme, there are a range of policy-specific risk assessments and tools in place, such as the National Flood Risk Assessment. Daniel Johnson. Cabinet Secretary for that answer. A constituent and climate change scientist recently uh, met with me to point out that temperatures in excess of 30 degrees are likely to be a much more frequently experienced occurrence in Scotland, going from once in a decade to much more frequent occurrences than that. Can I ask what impact assessment on schools and hospital um, has been made? Because obviously excessive temperatures can have a serious impact on frontline services such as schools and hospitals. Cabinet Secretary. Well, all of these um, uh, risks are, uh, um, are assessed. I, I don't know that there is a specific uh, risk attached in terms of uh, our assessment to schools and hospitals as opposed to public sector as a whole. Um, I'm happy to have a look at whether or not it does drill down as specifically as that. There are significant concerns uh, um, about our infrastructure across the board and not just to do with temperature because... Um, there is a big issue around the coastal erosion factor as well, and a number of these uh, buildings and, in, and essential infrastructure uh, developments are impacted by that too. And sometimes there are, uh, uh, there are double impacts that need to be taken into consideration. Um, I will uh, undertake to get back to the member on the very specific question that he's asked um, and ensure that uh, if there is an answer, he gets it. If there's not, that the question is therefore asked about that specifically. Uh, and uh, I hope that we will be able to have a proper conversation after about that.
Thank you. That concludes questions on environment, climate change and land reform. Point of order. Hey, presiding officer, uh, it's since such a, an important subject as nuclear waste being dumped into the, the, the River Clyde system, that a local member is not able to make a supplementary in such an important Would thing. Would you sit down, please, Mr. Patterson? It's not a point of order. It's a matter well, for the presiding. Sit down, please. It's for the presiding officer to decide on supplementaries and to get through questions. It's not a point of order. Uh, I now will move on to the next set of questions, rural economy and tourism. Uh, I remind members that questions two and six are grouped together. And I take question one, Claire Baker. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the potential impact on tourism of the coronavirus COVID-19. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, <clears throat> Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is working closely with Visit Scotland, our national tourism organisation, to monitor the situation as it develops and the impacts it might have on our tourism industry. At this stage, it's key that we share messaging about measures to limit the extent of the outbreak. Visit Scotland is the main conduit of information on COVID-19 to the industry and to current and future visitors, linking directly to the advice from the NHS and the Scottish Government. Claire Baker. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the response. The tourism as a sector which is already impacted by coronavirus, as bookings are being cancelled and holiday plans are being delayed. What can the Scottish Government do to support tourism businesses in the months ahead in terms of emergency support? And is there an opportunity to look at business rates which reflect the calls from the Scottish Tourism Alliance? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think all these things in due course will require very carefully to be considered. And the member is correct that uh, tourism uh, suffers earlier than, than other industries, principally because of cancellations. And many of these cancellations, presiding officer, are not really because of the facts, but perhaps a perception and media reports. I've already received myself, as members will have across the chamber, many expressions of concern, especially from small businesses in tourism that are particularly vulnerable. So this will be an issue that we will come back to, and we are taking at the moment very seriously, and I've fed in the concerns to SCORE, our equivalent to COBRA, uh, and will continue to do that. Just finish by saying that at the moment, the most important thing is to listen to and act upon and respond to all of us to do that, to the messaging put out by the health secretary, uh, by the, the chief medical officer and by others in order to best deal to minimize the consequences of this very serious virus. I have three supplementaries and some important questions, so I want them to be brief. Angus MacDonald, followed by Rachel Hamilton, followed by William MacArthur. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what discussions he's had with the food and drink sector eh, with regard to the potential impact of the coronavirus COVID-19? Cabinet Secretary. Um, eh, Presiding Officer, I had a, a conference call this morning, I think with 27 participants representing the main retail organisations in Scotland. Um, and we discussed a number of very important practical things which we will be taking forward. Uh, as regards the food and drink sector specifically, later this afternoon, I will be chairing a, by telephone again a, a resilience group of the food and drink se wider sector, and we will be discussing the practical impacts of the coronavirus and how best we can, at the moment, a, tackle them. Uh, and uh, rest assured, myself, along with, of course, all my colleagues in the Scottish Government, are treating this as the most important matter that requires to be dealt with us at this time. Rachel Hamilton, followed by William MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I draw members from a register of interest as a shareholder in a hospitality business? Uh, due to the pressures uh, on the hospitality and tourism industry and a potential drop in uh, visitor numbers to the UK due to coronavirus, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with calls from UK hospitality and the STA uh, that a delay or preferably abandoning proposals to introduce damaging tourism tax at this time uh, will be preferential? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it would be less than courteous if I didn't uh, welcome the member to her new responsibilities and I appreciate that she has a lifetime of experience in, in that. So let me welcome her to her role and I look forward to seeking to work constructively with her. Um, 
I, I do, with respect, though, about this question, think it's very, very important that we postpone concerns about other matters, which Parliament will deal with in due course, and the visitor levy is, is one of them. I think we really, with respect, should focus right now on the matters relating to the coronavirus and how to tackle them, and to make sure that we are engaging fully with sectors like, as Mr. McDonald said, the food and drink sector, the retail sector, to make sure that we are all, as a team, able to respond as effectively as possible to minimise and mitigate the consequences for all in Scotland, including the tourism sector. Liam McArthur. Will the Cabinet Secretary be aware of the growing importance of the cruise liner market to our uh, tourism sector, including uh, in uh, Orkney? What specific advice and support is government and its agencies able to give local authorities like Orkney Islands Council to ensure that any risks uh, related to cruise traffic are managed effectively? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, it, it, Ms McArthur is absolutely right. The cruise sector is extremely important to Scotland. It's one of the fastest growing sectors in tourism that, that we've had. I think it's grown around about tenfold uh, since this parliament was reconvened. And when I visited uh, Mr McArthur's constituency on holiday this summer, I saw just how popular uh, Kirkwall and the Orkneys are as a tourism destination for cruise liner passengers. Uh, and around the coast, that is that is the case. I can assure Mr MacArthur that, that there is close liaison with, uh, with all local authorities about how best to deal with the coronavirus. The headline messaging, which my colleague Jean Freeman is, is leading, it's important for us all, I think, as individuals, as citizens of Scotland, to get these messages across and continue uh, to, uh, uh, to follow the correct messaging and to use our role as leaders in society to make sure that others follow that lead as well. Question two, Andy Wells. To ask, <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government whether it supports the position of the UK or the EU on fishing rights in relation to the trade negotiations between the two administrations. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, my priority for the negotiations is, as it has always been, to defend the interests of the Scottish fishing industry and the wider uh, seafood supply chain. Annie Wills. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer because it is pretty sim a simple choice for the, the SNP government. Either they want the UK to take back control of our waters and become an independent coastal state or they want to drag us back to the hated CFP. Instead of the usual waffle, can we just get an answer? Will the SNP back the UK government and support Sc Scottish fishing or would they rather send our catch back to Brussels? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is disappointing that such a partisan uh, approach should be taken on this issue. And I, I have noticed, actually, over the recent weeks that uh, many who, who uh, may have supported uh, Brexit previously are now expressing questions, serious questions, about the emerging problems that are now becoming manifest. Firstly, the fact that, contrary to what Michael Gove told me, there will be in, uh, environmental health certificates. They will cost, it is estimated, up to 15 million, although that estimate was some time ago and may now be superseded. The first Boris Brexit bill. Secondly, we will see the people from other countries in Europe who are so important to the fishing communities around Scotland uh, being sent a message that they are not welcome to stay here. A poisonous and unpleasant and insidious message which this government totally and utterly rejects. And thirdly, we do not know what or if there will be any deal. We are completely in the dark. Fourthly, we don't know whether the desire to get a trade deal uh, will uh, take precedence over the former expressed interest in fishermen. Uh, so I think really uh, the Tories should perhaps go back and look at the facts about what is now emerging, about the consequences of their Brexit policy, which very few of them used to support, incidentally. Question six, Beatrice Wishart. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding its EU negotiations on aquaculture. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we haven't had uh, discussions specifically with the UK on aquaculture, but we are concerned about the approach which the UK government is taking in respect of tariffs uh, there and end. Beatrice Wishart. 
Aquaculture is hugely important to small rural communities. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that 23% of UK farmed salmon is produced in Shetland, and so too is 75% of Scottish farmed mussels. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that the industry could be hit with a sea of red tape as a consequence of leaving the European Union? And can he set out what additional resources are being planned to help producers to continue to export when the transition period comes to an end? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think I broadly do share these concerns, and I do know from a recent visit to Shetland just how important the aquaculture I I sector is to the, the Shetlands, and it sustains, of course, around 12,000 jobs in Scotland, uh, uh, and it is increasingly operating in accordance with the sustainable standards that we all support. And that is a task upon which we are committed and which lots of work is being done. Uh, a, for example, the announcement this morning, in an, uh, which I gave in response to a question from Mr. Gibson about regulation of RAS and a consultation there and then. So, yes, these matters are very important, and I'm pleased that the member has raised it in the chamber. Brief supplementary, Maureen Watt. The vile remarks of the Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack who claimed that migrant workers, including those who work in the fish processing industry in my constituency, only come here for benefits and access to the NHS. Would he therefore agree that this confirms why we need immigration policy devolved at the earliest opportunity? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I agree entirely. Such remarks fail to recognise the very valuable contribution made by non-UK workers to Scotland. And EU citizens and presenting officer add add on average an estimated £34,000 to Scottish GDP annually uh, and the expert advisory group on migration and population has also confirmed that EU migrants typically contribute more tax revenues than they consume through public services. However, it's not the monetary contribution that is so important. It's the human contribution. They come to Scotland, they choose to do so, they choose to work hard here. Isn't that a good thing for a human being to do, rather than one should, which should be treated with such contempt by the UK government? Question three, Gil Patterson. Uh, to ask the Scottish government what discussions it has had with the UK government regarding food and animal welfare standards in non-EU trade deals since the Rural Secretary's letter to the Secretary of State for, in, uh, for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs on the 20th of February. Minister Mary Grusham. The Scottish Government has consistently raised the importance of Scotland's globally recognised food and animal welfare standards not being sacrificed in order to secure trade deals. In recent days, officials have engaged with UK government counterparts in technical discussions to reiterate these concerns. And as yet, the UK government has not provided any reliable assurances that the likes of hormone-treated beef, amongst other products, will not be granted access to the UK market. Gil Patterson. Hey, does, does the Cabinet Secretary also have concerns, hey, the Minister, I should say, does the Minister also have concerns about the potential impact of the UK Government's proposed tariff regimes on Scotland's food and drink sector, including very valuable exports from my constituency, which goes worldwide? Minister? I uh, well, absolutely share those concerns. The Scottish Government and Scottish food and drink businesses have deep concerns about the potential impact of the tariff regime which has been proposed in the UK Government's rushed consultation. And we've been clear that unilateral reduction or removal of tariffs reduces the UK's negotiating capital and it exposes Scottish producers to increased competition from imports produced using lower and cheaper production standards. And I have to point out that there is a very real risk that that Scottish farmers and food producers are going to face the worst of both worlds in this situation, with high barriers and costs of trade to the EU, as well as competition against imported food produced to lower standards. And as I hinted at previously, the UK government offered, have as yet offered no guarantees that this won't happen. And we appear to be getting told to simply check the labels on our food. And our position is simple. We shouldn't be letting inferior products into the country in the first place. Question four, Edwin Banks. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to declare my register of interest uh, and to ask the Scottish Government, in light of the publication of the NFUS uh, document, Stability, the Platform for Change, what pilot schemes for agricultural support it will introduce for the 2021 claim year? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, presiding officer, as Mr Mountain, as convener of the REC committee, will be aware, I and Scottish Government officials recently gave evidence on this as part of stage one on the Agriculture Retained EU Law uh, and Data Scotland Bill and set out our approach and thinking on pilots. I note the stage one recommendations in this regard and will of course respond to that before stage two begins and I'm happy to keep Parliament updated on the development of policy on pilots. Edward Mountain. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for that answer but as we debate this this afternoon spring carving is underway and farmers who plan three to four years ahead need to know what to do with their calves now. Can the Cabinet Secretary bear this in mind and bring forward pilot schemes as quickly as possible so that farmers can see a way forward? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I'm always uh, acutely aware of the importance of providing uh, long-term assurances to farmers. And that's precisely why in this document we set out that approach, take us to 224. Uh, and it's why also I think it's most unfortunate that the UK government are taking an annual budget approach replacing the seven-year program that the EU provided in respect of rural support. That's exactly the opposite of the approach that uh, farmers require. What I do know is that farmers, and I think some of them are to my, to my left and Mr Mountain's uh, uh, colleagues, have happily received the first tranche of their convergence payments. Uh, uh, more than 17,400 active farmers have received £86.2 million. Pounds. I think farmers are very pleased that we're dealing with the day job effectively and getting out that financial support to them. Two brief supplementaries, Stuart Stevenson, followed by Colin Smith. Uh, I declare a part ownership in a registered agricultural holding. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that, contrary to Tory suggestions down south, agriculture and food producers are far from irrelevant? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I was actually astonished that uh, any government advisor uh, of the UK or any other government in these islands should say essentially that farmers and farming is expendable. It, it was quite shocking. And it does actually display an attitude which we believe has been prevalent in the Treasury for some time as anxious to get rid of support to farmers and crofters in Scotland. Well, they won't be doing it as long I'm around, that's for sure. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Does, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that, that one way that he can set out a clear direction of travel during the transitional period would be to include a purpose clause within the agricultural bill that's currently before Parliament, setting out what he believes those pilot schemes should be used for? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we'll come and debate the purpose clause in, in the bill and we'll take it very seriously and, and that's, that's absolutely right. But I would with respect say that, you know, what are farmers and crofters concerned about at the moment? They're concerned with paying their bills. They're concerned with carrying on their work. They're concerned with the unfounded attacks that are being made upon them by many quarters at the moment. What do they need from government? Well, they need the efficient administration of the support schemes, and that is something that we are delivering. And they need a clear sign about where Scotland is going, and we have provided that in the document I alluded to earlier, uh, and in many utterances in this parliament, and will continue to do so. Question five, Adam Tompkin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it's carried out of the potential impact on tourism in Scotland of the recent ruling against building a third runway at Heathrow Airport. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we do not hold sector-specific analysis. However, we're clear that now more than ever, Scotland needs to have excellent connections with the rest of the world. That will be through a mix of direct routes from Scotland and connections to global hubs like Heathrow, Dubai and Amsterdam. Visit Scotland and partners will continue to work with key stakeholders to ensure that Scotland is an attractive destination which is easily reached by our visitors. Adam Tompkin. Uh, well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer, but with respect, it's as clear as mud. So can we have a bit of clarity on this? Is the Scottish Government in favour of a hub airport at Heathrow for Scotland's uh, tourism and other economic sectors? Yes or no? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've already, actually, if you'd listened said that we need to, to have global connections through, amongst others, in, in, in Heathrow. I've really said that. I'm bound to point out, and I know a member may not be too happy about this, but uh, it was under Chris Grayling's instruction that the UK government omitted to take account of its commitment to the Paris Agreement and climate action in its drive to build a third runway at Heathrow. And the consequences came at the Court of Appeal 
when the project was, was refused permission to take off. I mean, perhaps if the UK government paid more attention to the day job, they wouldn't keep getting defeated in court. Patrick Harvey, it must be brief. Isn't the real lesson of the defeat of the unlawful attempt to expand Heathrow in defiance of the climate emergency that the Scottish Government should have spent the last decade and more reorienting our Scottish tourism industry around surface travel instead of schmoozing with the unsustainable airline industry and trying to win them tax breaks? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, it may not surprise anyone to hear that I don't agree with the characterisation that Mr Harvey places on this matter. Uh, we have taken great steps in improving connectivity in Scotland and we recognise that uh, one way in which visitors come to Scotland will be uh, through air routes and that is important. It will continue to be important and Scotland needs more direct air routes uh, which of course uh, have many advantages. So uh, that's our view in the Scottish Government. If Mr Harvey wants to cease aviation entirely throughout the world, if that's his policy, it's not one that I support. Thank you. That concludes those questions on Portfolio Rural Economy and Tourism. I apologise to Jamie Green and Joan McAlpine. If you take supplementaries, I'm afraid some people uh, get omitted at the end. It's a difficult balance. And if shortly move on to the next item of business.